Welcome to Painting the Monster Manual. I'm Matt, and I've been playing D&D and painting miniatures for more than 25 years now. I thought it would be neat to have a bit of a video diary for the painting challenge I wanted to take for 2024. When I first bought my 3D printer, I was looking for models to use for D&D, Pathfinder, Warhammer, whatever. I saw someone talking about a challenge called Printing the Monster Manual when I went on to various uh, 3D printing websites. I thought it would be a really fun thing to do. Just go A to Z and either purchase directly from my FLGS or buy the STL for each monster from an artist on my mini factory and paint it up to look like the picture. Uh, sometimes I might get these for free. If there's no real good STL for sale, then I'll display them near my gaming table in alphabetic order so that when we're playing and the DM needs a particular monster, it can be easily retrieved. I'm going to try to acquire the minis based on what looks closest to the picture with an eye for quality in mind. So some monsters may be purchased from WizKids, some might be STLs from artists, and some might even be Warhammer models if they fit and are the right size. Warhammer models tend to be just a little bit larger than normal 28 millimeter models, so you know sometimes they just don't fit even though they look good. I'll film the painting and do a bit of voiceover for a deeper dive into whatever it is that I'm painting. Mainly, I'd like to describe the culture of the creature, if it has any, habits it might have, where it might live, and how I might use it in a campaign. If there are any bespoke campaigns that Wizards of the Coast have that I think might fit the monster, I'll suggest that. And if applicable, I'll explain how I would use the creature as an NPC and how a player might be able to use the creature as a PC. As a note on the paint quality, none of these will win any competitions, and I won't be focusing on spending 100 hours on each miniature. I'm trying to make something that works. At most, I aim to spend about 2-3 to three hours on each mini, with the aim that they would look close to the picture in the monster manual, and look good from about 3-4 to four feet away. As some of them might look good up close as well. I don't want this challenge to take 10 years, because I have campaigns I'm playing in and DMing for now, and the results should be pretty easy to copy with a bit of practice. I didn't think about it before, but I'll try to list all of the paints I use in the vids and what color they approximately represent if you have another brand of paints. Since I didn't think about even making this channel until after I started the challenge, the first two monsters have some paint on them already. The Aarakocra is about half painted due to my daughter Evelyn, and the Aboleth is completely painted, which I did sort of as a proof of concept to see exactly how long it would take to paint a miniature and just what it would look like afterward, and if I could even really match approximately what's in the Monster Manual's pictures. I'll show a bit of footage of the Aboleth when talking about it, and I'll even record myself painting the rest of the Aarakocra, since um, Evelyn's probably has her own stuff that she wants to paint. My daughter may help me as well on some of the monsters, since she enjoys painting and it's good family time spent together. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start with the Aarakocra. There may be a few monsters in each video, but I'll try to keep it to that normal YouTube length that I see most often of between 20 and 30 minutes. The Aarakocra is a race of bird creatures that look a little bit like uh, bipedal sentient hawks. They have this really interesting clothing design. It looks like they wear mostly like wraps and cloaks and things like that. I'm assuming things that don't get in the way when they're actually flying. They come from the Howling Gyre, or Howling Gear. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's apparently a place of endless storms and lashing rains that surrounds uh, the Aqua, or A-A-Q-A, in the elemental plane of air. They kind of act as scouts, and apparently... Maybe the endless storms and lashing rains are, are like protecting the inner core of the civilization. I know that they act as scouts against invading earth elementals and gargoyles, who are their sworn enemies. I don't know exactly how gargoyles got to be their sworn enemies, but I'm guessing from invasions. Or uh, They also scout out temples of elemental evil for somebody called the Wind Dukes of Aqua. They create Ares near elemental portals, but it feels kind of more like they're nomadic as a species, as they don't really stay there for more than a couple of years. Or I mean, they'll stay there as long as it takes to root out this temple of elemental evil and get it destroyed, but does if after that they have no qualms about just moving on. What's kind of interesting is they don't really value ownership of most things. They they use what they need, and then it says that they cast the rest to the wind. So you could imagine, like, half-eaten jelly sandwiches falling on, 
on it, on PCs from Eric Kirker. They're just like, well, I'm full. They don't particularly care about political borders or gems or gold or really anything that you would normally consider in a society. So I could also see them being a point of contention as they might invade a political border in search of some you know, elemental evil or gargoyle or nest of earth elementals and, and just not care about whatever the ruling faction thinks. However, they do seem to be looking for these seven rod shards that combine to make what's called a, a rod of law. It's a magical item that is used to kill very powerful monsters. And apparently in their past, it was created and then used to to kill a really powerful monster. And that's what kind of broke it up into seven different uh, shards. They must have some affinity to the realm of air because despite being naturally not very magical, if you have five of them together, they can perform a dance that will summon an air elemental. I'm thinking that maybe the dance is kind of like the Witter Shins from the Witch Lake carnival that would be really neat if it was but i guess they have to five of them have to dance real hard and they can summon an air elemental they are sea level cr one quarter but you could probably upscale them a bit if you wanted to by giving them levels or you know a particular class maybe ranger with an air elemental pet or fighter styles of all sorts would work as well uh, they're sl- they seem slightly magical coming from an elemental plane of air, so maybe even something like a, an Eldritch Knight with a focus for air spells of some sort. I could also see them as adversaries that aren't really evil, but maybe just have a different worldview. They may be allies at one point and maybe just pains in the butt in others. They're kind of a good example of monsters that might be thrown in when your characters, when you want your characters to think that you're they shouldn't just slaughter something and maybe kind of think about what the motives of the beings are. Cause so I could imagine players showing up for some invading force of these, um, of these Aarakocra. They start to fight them and the Aarakocra are like, why are you shielding these evil creatures? And the players like, what, what are you talking about? You know? And, and then they find out that they're, they're just coming in to destroy some evil and they're not really invading anybody's lands. They are neutral and apparently good, and that's interesting because they follow these wind dukes and actively try to get that magic item that's inherently lawful, the rod of law. So I don't know, maybe they started out as like this lawful, good civilization, and then as it deteriorated, as they were assaulted more and more by these forces of elemental evil, they kind of devolved into neutral good maybe they just don't care so much about laws as long as they're getting the job done. I kind of feel like maybe they would be a good, like, Batman character, you know? They would, they're fighting against evil, but they're not necessarily working with the police or constables or what have you, local governments, kings. As NPCs, they could be good wayfarers or rangers to help the PCs get the lay of the land, maybe even from a bird's-eye view. They could be a pretty neat troll NPC, and by that I mean they could mess with the player characters, because they might just throw things off a cliff that they don't need. Gems, gold, food, what have you. You can just imagine the PC's shock when they they give Aarakocra some sort of amount of money, and he's like, oh yeah, I really needed five gold for this or that. And the characters are like, well, I gave you ten gold, and he just tosses the extra five off of a cliff throws it to the bottom of a ravine. Since they fight monsters of elemental evil, they might be good to run as a character in a plane of elemental evil campaign. I could kind of also see them in uh, in anywhere where the multiverse is a thing. They might be a good sort of player character in a uh, a spell jammer campaign too. So that's the Aarakocra. And, you know, before this, I thought they were kind of a throwaway race, but now I'm kind of seeing a little bit more about how they could be used and, and really what their role might actually be in a, in a campaign or in a society. The Aboleth. When I think of a true Cthulhu-esque monster, this is kind of what I have in mind. You can see it has three eyes, one atop the other, and it would probably give you a headache just to see through their eyes. So I could see that if somebody maybe cast a, um, a spell that allowed you to see through its eyes, you get blinding headaches from just trying to see that much. I'd imagine that it would provide an almost 180 degree view of up and down. So he could, he could watch his, you know, above him and below him at the same time as in front. Interestingly, they also secrete a mucus that allows them to breathe air and water. And if it 
loses the ability to secrete the mucus, it actually suffocates. If you can get any of this stuff on you, it actually causes your skin to mutate into a gray membrane that can breathe in water, and you become a mindless servant to this awful creature. They're very intelligent, very evil, and just incredibly self-serving creatures. Aboliths inherit racial memories, so they don't actually have to learn anything new. Uh, they just always know everything about every abolith that came before them. And any abolith can theoretically live forever, which is their goal. And it keeps growing as it's living. So the one that I'm showing on camera here would weigh about 6,500 pounds and can stretch from mouth to tail to around 20 feet. So they have to be pretty dense. You know, if you think about it, a large creature typically doesn't weigh about 6,500 pounds. There are tales of aboliths reaching 50 feet in length, especially ancient ones. It's in also interesting that they acknowledge the power and the presence of gods, but they don't actually worship any gods themselves. And I could see this being because their inherited racial memories allow them to remember a time before the modern pantheon existed. So... You know, if you think about it, if you were alive before Thor existed, wouldn't you say, well, yeah, he's got some power, but I don't know if I'd want to worship him because I was here before him. Why didn't he worship me? You know, something like that. They do have a very high respect for what's called the elder evils because they've always just been a presence in their shared memory. And I'm thinking that's sort of like Cthulhu-esque monsters also, like giant Cthulhu monsters. Thankfully, most of these creatures live deep underwater. Sometimes they rule over Kuatoa, who do their bidding, and sometimes they just live in old dilapidated ruins underwater. The Kuatoa, they describe as foolish, but I guess, you know, every even a maniac like this thing needs some servants to do things. As for their usage as a monster, they may be a good monster. It's just hiding in a cove or a cave or somewhere you know, underneath the water. They, they don't really hesitate to kill mortals. They just kind of see them as either livestock or nothing, not even really intelligent creatures, just like pests. And they're quite alien. So inter their interference in Faerun's above water civilization could be weird and uncomprehending, or it could just be as simple as they don't like the boats that disturb the water over their lair. Most notably, as a DM, you could use a monster like this in Dungeon of the Mad Mage once your players have the Stone of Galore. Uh, perhaps maybe brethren to the Aboleth trapped in the stone, or maybe it's just the stone itself. I think these things would be terrifying to encounter in the Underdark or on the open water, so Ghosts of Salt Marsh are really good. Out of the Abyss would be horrible. Uh, can you imagine meeting this thing in a like underground lake in the you know, in the underdark, in complete darkness. And um, Locantha Rising setting would also work as well, although I haven't played that one, so I'm just kind of guessing because the Kuotoa aspect. I don't think they would make good NPCs as they don't seem to particularly care for diplomacy. And their goal, other than the goals that are perhaps too alien to understand, is really just to live forever. If one dies, it's considered to have just failed at life. Uh, that's that's considered a failure in their eyes is death. So it will do anything it can to survive, backstab anybody. There are no like allies, no no higher goals, no reproductive cares or anything. They just kind of lay eggs and then they just leave. I couldn't imagine a situation where a player would want to play as an Aboleth or even could play as an Aboleth. But if you whip this thing out at the end of a mid-level dungeon, I think it'd be a pretty scary fight. Angels. They are the messengers of the gods, the voice of their authority. They prosecute missions both diplomatic and militaristic. They're beautiful and dreadful and can be any or no gender, yet they are not infallible. I like to think of angels in my games as born sure on the material plane. That meaning they are sure of their task and themselves when they first arrive, but can be shaped or influenced by the creatures living there. As a player, I've seen angels used in much the same way as a god, meaning a voice of supreme authority, and as a bully and a plot hammer. I rarely use angels, but when I do, I always put them in a situation where they absolutely could be tempted and fall from grace. Much of the time, I leave that up to my players because I think that when a player's actions affect the world around them, it creates the feeling of a living world. 
There are three distinct angel types in the Monster Manual. First, there's the Deva. These curly-haired angels act as divine messengers and agents to the material realm, the Shadowfell, and the Feywild. They look like incorrigible thirst traps. Seriously, look at those abs. Their skin is silver, and they are a CR-10 creature. I don't think I've ever used one of these monsters in a fight against PCs. However, if I were to use one outside of having to, something to attack evil PCs with, it would probably be as a misunderstanding scenario. That would be where the Deva is tricked into attacking the party, or the party is tricked into attacking the Deva. Though I typically let dice fall where they lay in fights, I wouldn't shield a Deva from death by DM intervention if a PC manages to land a killing blow. I think it would be far more interesting to watch a party strive to clear up the misunderstanding after they unintentionally slay a deva. If the attack was a mistake, they may even gain the god's favor by slaying a servant who has themselves made a mistake. As the monster manual makes quite clear, intentional and unintentional acts of evil doom an angel to be fallen. So if it gets killed instead of an innocent PC it is tricked into attacking, the god doesn't lose one of its servants and only has to extend more power to reincarnate the angel to the material plane. Some gods may see this as a good trade. NPCs are where the bread and butter of the Deva will come into use. You have to be careful, especially in lower level campaigns, to not outshine the PCs with an NPC. As an angel, the Deva does have to be careful of unintentional evil acts. So it makes sense why it would send players on a mission and trust their judgment to see the situation from all sides and shades of gray. I don't think angels and especially these ones are really capable of seeing shades. So I don't really think they would trust themselves to be able to see all sides of the situation. Angels as a player would only really work if every player was an angel and it was a very specific type of campaign. It could work as a one shot. But I don't think I could ever base an entire campaign around trying to guide a group of murderous PC angels. Uh, you know those PCs. They would fall from grace very quickly, I think. Or at least one of them would. Next, there's the Planetar. These bald, translucent green angels mete out justice according to the god they're aligned to. Specific examples from the Monster Manual include relieving a drought or causing an insect plague to devour crops. You can't lie to them, and they see through any falsehood with their milky white eyes. This is probably the type of angel I hate seeing the most as a player. Can you imagine being a player and some green-skinned bald guy comes to your town and says, Hey, time for you guys to starve for a bit because my god said so. Then he has his bug friends just like eat up all your crops. It says that they enjoy battling fiends, but I sincerely doubt that they do that as much as they influence nature and the weather to help or hurt a civilization. They are CR-16, so I'm not sure how to use these guys in any enjoyable way for either the players or myself. Maybe if the players are high enough level and they're assaulting some stronghold full of fiends, a few of these guys might come down and assist in the assault, and that would make for a pretty good battle. It may be fun for a high-level campaign for the players to track a fallen planetar as it carves out a path of destruction around civilizations. That may even be interesting enough to form a campaign around, but as a DM, I would have to be really careful that the players not encounter the fallen angel until near the end of the campaign, or, or else they might get just decimated, or they'll do something stupid and get killed. I talked a bit about angels as PCs, but it would be interesting for a group of PC angels tasked with the destruction of the infrastructure of a civilization to investigate just why they have to destroy everything and maybe come up with a more scalpel approach to their task rather than the sledgehammer of murder all the crops and starve everybody in the city. Finally, there's the almighty CR-21 Solar. There are only 24 Solars in existence, and they can instantly kill creatures with their arrows of slain. They have dancing weapons that attack on their own and can even have legendary actions. They're godlike and kept in a state of suspended animation called a trance until they're needed. I don't necessarily think that I would use one of these except to herald an event of great significance. They're apparently used to stave off cosmic threat. Maybe they're better used in Spelljammer than normal D&D. It's just difficult with a CR-21 creature, e even as a monster, because a lot of players just can't handle this. And a lot of monsters are set up in this manual to provide feels-bad experiences. So, for instance, if there was a player who got up to level 20 and their entire shtick was 
you know, maybe magic. Let's say they're a wizard and they're attacking. They're a good attack wizard. They sling fireballs and arrows of acid and these types of things. And then all of a sudden you throw in a CR 21 monster that's completely immune to magic just because the monster manual says it is. I, that's such a negative play experience for a character that's level 20 because they typically will end up looking around and saying, I guess I hit it with my stick or I do nothing, which you never want a player to look around and say, I guess I do nothing or I guess I do this. You want them to be able to use their kit in interesting ways. Very rarely will I use monsters of this CR just because a lot of the time they tend to be unfair. These angels are probably best used in the Princes of the Apocalypse and Descent into Avernus campaign settings. I suppose Spelljammer Adventures as well, but the first two really have that whole good versus evil theme baked into them. I don't really know, looking down the list of campaigns, what I would, what else I would use them for, unless it's maybe a homebrew thing. But hey, I guess they'll be on the shelf in case I need one as an NPC. Thank you for joining me for the first episode of Painting the Monster Manual. It's been a neat creative journey to learn the software and how the hardware works and sort of get this all together. Also, special thanks to my wife for her support and patience. The next episode will have some really interesting animated monsters, and I may begin to incorporate entertaining stories from when I was playing or DMing, if I think that applies. Thank you very much, and have a great day.